was about 17, 18, 19, something like that, some age around that, and I, um, I gave up dancing, ballet dancing, because at the age of 16, I had just thought that it was too geeky, um, which was quite silly, but um, I started going to gym, to Virgin Active in Johannesburg, and was bouncing around up and down on steps and doing weight training and just generally really enjoyed keeping fit. And um, after my gym class, there was usually either a Tai Chi class or a yoga class next door. So I started to go to the Tai Chi and yoga and really, really enjoyed both of them. And I remember at one point thinking, oh, you know, um, am I going to do Tai Chi or yoga? Because I knew that I wanted to take up one um, kind of form. And it was the yoga that really won out. And uh, from then, I discovered a Shtanga Vinyasa, a very energetic form of yoga, and that was just for me amazing because I had always felt with gym that you were kind of running up and down on a step or you were on some kind of treadmill, and that it was almost like a subconscious way of saying that I was doing this because I didn't feel I was good enough. I was doing this because I felt like I was out of shape or I wanted to fix myself or whatever it was. But with, with Ashtanga Vinyasa, I could really get a, a great workout physically, but there was some other deeper purpose to doing this practice, to being on the mat. And um, I guess it must have been about six months at the gym um, doing yoga, and I found a, a local yoga studio that taught Ashtanga Vinyasa, and I really just packed in the gym bunny gear and never went back. And the rest is history. Um, I have spent a lot of my time in India and I would spend probably all of my time in India if I could and I'm sure at some point I will. Um, I've traveled to India possibly nine or ten times. I lose count over the last uh, eight years. The first time it was 2004, so it's eight years. And I've um, spent a lot of time journeying a lot on my own and occasionally with um, my ex-partner or somebody um, to various obscure places um, to hang out with yogis um, in caves and um, in tiny weeny little unknown ashrams at the bottom of mountains and um, really being introduced from one person to the next and, and being very blessed in who I've been able to spend time with. So um, I spent time with the Aghoris in, in Nepal. The Aghoris are a pretty um, extreme sect of yogis. Um, it's a whole story in itself, um, sort of a, a tantric sect of yogis. And I revisited them this year again and learned about um, Jarabuti, which is the uh, Nepalese version of Ayurveda, or the Nepalese herbal medicine. And I've spent uh, a lot of time in South India with various Vaidyas, Ayurvedic doctors, but also with a very, very wonderful um, lineage of Siddha yogis. Um, uh, it's a four-year unbroken lineage from a particular Siddha called Borganath. Um, all the way to today, it's an unbroken lineage from father to son who have looked after the Borgonat Shrine. And um, very extraordinary science that they've got um, that includes yoga and mudra and uh, um, the stars called money and uh, various other... I mean, essentially, it's a way of studying nature and the ancient yogis and what they've passed down through this lineage is how to acknowledge what's happening in nature and how to be a perfect part of it. And so using all the elements of nature beyond the name of yoga and yoga asana and the things that we call yoga, purely about nature, so that you can become perfected in your being um, and eventually become enlightened like in Samadhi. And, and again, that could become another five-hour lecture on, on what that process is and, and, and what the kind of philosophy of, of it is. Um, and other than that, spending a lot of time with teachers around South India, including people like Tabi Joyce and Sharat of the Ashtanga Vinyasa lineage, um, and uh, Iyengar teachers and people all over the show, really. I've been kind of everywhere. <laughs> it's an amazing place. That's a very good question. Um, my routine is, is changing a lot at the moment. I was actually just saying to a friend earlier that um, the past uh, number of years, um, my practice has been focused very much on alignment in the asana and finding correct alignment um, and finding balance in the body through alignment. Um, and, and certainly that focus is still there. But my most recent focus, I'm um, speaking the last few months, and I think it's going to be my next kind of big I don't want to use the word project, but uh, my next kind of 
area of, of where I'd like to discover is how to be more efficient energy wise. So I'm finding um, physically that my body is becoming a little less, I have a little less energy in the last few months, uh, perhaps in the last year, I've various reasons why that could be. Um, and so I'm finding ways of working in the asana that's less demanding of energy, but where I can still get the alignment and I can still um, experience the asana without working so hard into it. Um, I'm being careful that it's not becoming like lazy yoga. Certainly the alignment should still be there and, and the awareness is still there, but without as much tension or force in the body. Um, I haven't perfected this yet, but uh, I have certain ideas around how, how I can find that and they, they seem to be working so far. Um, so that's really my focus at the moment. I'm doing a lot more um, meditation, a lot more pranayama, and a lot more restorative yoga in my own sadhana, in my own practice. So to me, an internal guidance system is, wow, that's, that's, been, that's been the last five years of figuring that one out. <laughs> um, I'm still trying to figure that one out. Um, I, I do believe that you, you get certain people um, who they, they'll say, oh, you know, you just got to follow your heart. And, and to an extent, I think that that is true, that you should really follow your heart because it seems that uh, you know a lot of time we can make heads to, uh, our mind up or make decisions purely from our head or from logic. And perhaps sometimes it doesn't turn out right. Perhaps sometimes it does. I don't know. I mean, I'm not like, I haven't figured this stuff out yet, but I, I do feel that sometimes what happens is that we tend to, when I say we, I mean kind of people more in, in the yoga or new age or kind of like more spiritual field, just follow your heart. And I've seen people follow their heart because they have a feeling about something and they don't use their given gift of logic in order to work out the practicalities of what their heart is telling them. And they've gone down a road that has actually landed them in a lot of stress and trouble. Um, so I've, you know, I've watched that in, in a number of people um, in my life and realized that there's this balance between following your heart and also being pragmatic. And what I guess I've done over the last kind of few years is become a little bit more cynical of following your heart and followed my head too much and realized in the last short while that um, it's really got to be a balance between both, that um, um, it's, 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 it's using both together and not one and then the other making comparisons, but somehow being able to make those two things speak together. I met a, a very wonderful yogi in Nepal earlier in this year. He's a, a tantric shaman and um, just a fascinating guy. And it's actually a very interesting story, which I have to share. Um, there's tigers in the mountains in Nepal, and that is true. We actually saw footprints of the tigers when we were hiking there, um, when I was hiking with him. And um, the story goes that uh, it must have been now maybe 25, 20 years ago, that his grandmother, this guy's Lakshman's grandmother, was eaten by a tiger and uh, in the mountains. And from that moment forward, Lakshman had these unbelievable kind of powers or cities, and he's been a healer since then. So people come from around Nepal, um, or at least from around Kathmandu, to um, receive healing from him. And uh, he's a very interesting guy. I can't vote, I vouch for the healing powers, but um, certainly a very wise and lovely person to spend time with. Anyway, um, he had this beautiful way of saying that the, the that mind needs to descend to the heart. And in a way, it's like the, the mind needs to rest in the heart. And that's when we can make decisions that are the most useful to us. And I just think it's a very beautiful way of, of thinking about things and looking at them. And um, I suppose I've taken inspiration from him and, and begun more and more to try and make decisions based on that. I'll have to let you know in a few years' time whether that worked out for me. <laughs> Again, one of those really big questions, because I have had uh, 10, 12 years experience with these things, I've kind of built up a lot of different impressions and also watched my own development over the years and, and seen how my um, approach to things has changed. Um, I used to be a very, very strict vegetarian and even a vegan for many years, and um, I ate purely sattvic and followed all the rules of the sattvic yoga diet and felt that um, because I was doing so much asana a day, so much kriya or pranayams a day, so much mantra a day, so much um, sattvic dieting and organic food and all these things that purely because I followed those rules everything would end up wonderful. 
that um, I would be perpetually blissed out and my body would be forever young in a sense. Um, I discovered in a very hard way that that's not true, um, that at the end of the day, um, those things that I was doing were conceptual um, and ritual and not at all um, cognizant of nature and the nature that my body is and the nature that is around me and, and where I live in the world in England. And um, one of the probably wisest people I've, I've met or at least um, most useful people in, in my life, um, one of my teachers in South India from the city yoga tradition, I was visiting here again in 2008 and he looked at me and he said, you're looking very, very ill. And I said, I know I'm, I'm really not feeling great. And he said to me, are you vegetarian? And I said, yes, of course, I'm, you know, sattvic vegetarian, so many hundred Hare Krishna mantras, maha mantras a day, you know, I'm following all the rules. And I thought that he'd be very, very pleased with me because he is from this incredible lineage and the head of it. And um, he looked at me and he said, no, no, no. He says, uh, you're not practicing yoga, you're practicing religion. Um, he said, you know, you're given this beautiful human body and, and it's given to you as a vehicle to be able to be strong in and to be able to um, do the work that you've got to do in this world. And you're basically, because of your religion, you're destroying it. And that is not yoga. That is quite the opposite. It's like an ah yoga. It's the opposite of yoga. And um, it really was a, a moment of, of, of um, awakening for me um, in realizing, wow, well, he's right. I mean, I'm really not feeling well and I'm doing everything so-called correctly, but obviously I've missed the point entirely. And uh, he looked at me and he said, um, you really should actually be eating meat. And it was a, it was a, a concept that was very, very... Uh, alien to me because I trained myself over so many years. I've been vegetarian for 16 years that that was just not something that I was ever going to do. And um, I came back home and had various blood tests done to see why I was having these problems. You know, I was having uh, nerve end troubles in my feet and my hands and various problems associated with a severe B12 deficiency and jaundice and various other things going on. And um, the test showed that I was severely anemic. B12 deficient and deficient in a lot of other vitamins as well. And um, I had to take his advice and study to meet him. My life has really changed um, for the positive since then. And uh, he, he said that the ancient um, sittas um, didn't exclude meat from their diet. They would include anything that was going to keep them the most vital that they could be. And they would do that with the utmost reverence to nature around them. So you wouldn't become greedy and just have the kind of like... Uh, um, feasts all the time of, of meat that was was farmed in, in an inhumane way or, or in, um, in a way that's really, really not nice for animals and not being killed is not nice for any animal. But um, what I've done is, is I include meat when I really need it. My body will tell me when I need it and I'll, I'll have uh, meat that's from a very organic source and from perfectly a, a sort of a source that I know is, is really good to the animals, very high welfare for the animals. Um, but aside from that, the lesson really was that what can happen is that we get given this kind of tradition of yoga and um, um, we can feel that that's the answer to everything, that if you just do your yoga every day, everything will be solved and almost rest into the religion of the yoga. And uh, the lesson I had was that the practice of yoga is not just following various rules, but rather learning how to listen to yourself and learning how to respond to nature that is around you. And that's the real mastery of it. Uh, recently, I um, was accepted to study... Um, well, this demands a little bit of back history. I have had um, a hip problem, which is very interesting because... I have, through teaching, met a lot of uh, people who have had hip problems, and most of them, when I speak to them, it turns out that they are uh, previous long-term ballet dancers who followed up their ballet career with the Shtanga Vinyasa, um, which is obviously a very similar history to where I am from, and uh, it seems to be a pretty repetitive story. Um, so because of this, this, this hip problem I was having, I started to do some Pilates in between my yoga. I'm, also ultra, ultra flexible quite naturally. And so the Pilates has helped to kind of bring me back together again to make the chassis of my body, so to speak, a lot more um, resilient and a lot more bound. Um, it's been extremely good for my yoga practice. So um, I've included maybe two or three days a week of Pilates into my into my regular kind of exercise regime and, and an asana practice. And um, 
recently I applied to study with a extremely well-renowned, world-renowned uh, Pilates teacher called Alan Herdman. Um, and Alan was the first person to bring Pilates to the UK, and he studied in New York in the 60s, I think it was, um, with some of the original people who studied from Joseph Pilates. So he's, he's built up a reputation for being um, very, very good at working remedially with both dancers and also older students or people with injuries. And so in the next year, I'm going to be studying quite intensively um, with him and with um, the teachers at his studio in really learning how the body um, moves, learning probably a lot more about anatomy than I know now, and also learning how to work remedially. Um, I've had a few yoga teachers a little astounded that I'm, I'm turning towards a, such an intense study of Pilates, um, but in in my mind, it's just, you know, if you get past the labels of yoga, essentially you're working with, initially at least on the material level, you're working with bones and you're working with skin and you're working with the human being that's inside that bone, the, you know, the skin and the bones, and that human being um, needing to be happy when the body is working properly. And um, whatever it is that I can learn in order to be better at um, allowing me to help people just on the physical level to move properly um, is wonderful. And so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to getting stuck in and, and learning everything he's got to teach me. Um, a part of that I'm going to be, I'm soon to start um, just a, a blog really, a magazine blog called the Satsang Journal, um, which is just blogging my studies in terms of philosophy. Um, I do a lot of reading about philosophy, both in terms of French philosophy and, and um, various interesting people within the free thought movement, but also in terms of um, um, Hinduism and, and Vedic religion. Um, and then also blogging my discoveries uh, in yoga teaching and, and also studying with Alan Herdman. So I'll be focusing a lot on that. Um, teaching wise, I do a lot of teaching around London. Um, and I suppose the best thing in terms of teaching is just to find my telephone number. I'm sure it'd be somewhere on Love Yoga Online and um, get in touch or my email address. Mm -hmm.